So hello my fellow friends, so today we're gonna start a new chapter, we're not afraid to die if we can all be together. So this is a beautiful lesson written by Gordon Cook and Alan East. So it's a story about this one family who thought of it as a good idea to go like a world tour or something on the uh, boat thingy and then a lot of drastic adventurous stuff happen and they've written about it. So let's see what happened. Did they survive or did they like dr uh, drown and die or whatever happens. So let's start. In July 1976, my wife Mary, son Jonathan, six, daughter Susan, seven, and I set sail from Parliament, England to duplicate the round the uh, world voyage made 200 years earlier by James Cook, Captain James Cook. So um, this story is like narrated by the father of this family okay i mean the man of this family so it's narrated by him so now he's introducing the characters in the story so there's wife mary son jonathan of uh, who's six years old and daughter susan who is seven years old so they set sail from parliament england to duplicate the round the world voyage I mean, 200 years ago so uh captain james kirk this guy is like the og person to like um make this map thingy or whatever for this uh, world voyage so they are gonna like what is it try do the same kind of thing like try to go on this voyage so yeah for the longest time mary and i a 37 year old businessman had dreamt of sailing in the wake of a uh, famous explorer and for the past 16 years we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in british waters so mary as well as him uh, he is a 70 i mean no not 70 37 year old businessman and mary his wife so both of them have been like constantly training themselves to like um so that this kind of tour would be like you know you have when you're going on this long of a tour and if you don't know how to survive how to survive how to ride this boat and if you don't know all these skills it's going to be really hard right so they had to like improve their skills and things so that it would be more easier for them to handle things and also like all these safety measures and things they had to know otherwise like it was so likely for them not to come out come back safe if they didn't know all these sort of things yeah so yeah they had to brush up these skills and all in the british waters so they did all the training and stuff in their british waters a boat wave walker a 23 meter 30 ton wooden hull beauty like it's just like how the boys like describe their uh favorite bike or car like th 23 meters 30 ton the world wooden hull beauty <laughs> that's exactly how my friends do it <laughs> you know he's He's a whatever. Had been professionally built and we had spent months fitting it out, testing it in the roughest weather we could find. So uh, they had to do these certain things, right? They had to test it and do all those sort of things so that they, the boat would stay accountable to them in like harsh conditions and when everything kind of fails, like it had to work. So that's why they are testing it in the hardest weathers and things so that it would help them out. The first leg of a plant three year. 105,000 kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. So they began the journey from west coast of Africa to Cape Town. There, before heading east, we took on two crewmen, crewmen American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Segler. So American, this one American guy and this one Swiss guy. So they've uh, brought two homies to like have fun i guess <laughs> so to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas the south indian ocean so shout out to our south indian ocean <laughs> yeah so that's one of like the roughest seas you know they're having so many accidents and stuff there like it's really hard to like do whatever there yeah uh on our second day out of cape town we i mean cape town wow i've <laughs> been calling him cape town <laughs> Yeah, so Cape Town is the place, okay? So uh, uh, on our second day out of Cape Town, we began to encounter strong gales for the next few weeks. They blew continuously. Gales didn't worry me, but the size of the waves were alarming. Up to 15 meters as high as our main mast. So after they headed out of Cape Town, uh, they encountered these strong, huge gales. So um, And they were like blowing continuously for like the past few weeks. And even the gales didn't worry him how, how strong it was. But the size of the waves was quite alarming because it was like uh, as tall as their main mast so that's how huge the waves were coming up and that kind of alarmed him and on december 25th found us 3500 kilometers east of cape town despite atroc despite the atrocious weather we had a wonderful holiday complete with a christmas tree so 
so now it was december 25th and they were like 3000 sort of kilometers away in the east of cape town and despite the horrible weather they had this wonderful holiday like december 25th and all they have christmas stuff like so they celebrated the christmas and then next was the new year and the uh, weather showed no improvement but they were certain to like certain that it would change soon and it did change but for the worse meaning that it did change but it got even worse so at dawn of january 2 the waves were gigantic so uh, first he did warn about the waves being as huge as their main mast but now they were even more gigantic and they were sailing only on with only a small storm jib and we're still making eight knots so that's all like boat techno things so i mean ship techno things so we don't even require any of this like they won't even ask any of these questions and like that examines stiff i mean yeah so you don't have to like know all the techno words of the ship because just because this author knows and is bragging about those fancy words doesn't mean we have to yeah if you if you like if you are that desperate to get like complete mark, marks for all of your questions and maybe use one or two of these fancy words but i wouldn't recommend it and i have my exam tomorrow like the finals and look at me here <laughs> yeah so um as the ship rose to the top of each wave we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us so and uh, screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ear so just try to like close your eyes and imagine what all things are happening uh, you're on this ship that's like wackling around and then you see this huge wave approaching you and then this wind moving here and there and like making such huge noises like it's so kind of a panic situation right here and let's see what he does right let's see what he's gonna do so to slow the boat down we dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope in a uh, loop across the stern so um storm jib is nothing but that anchor thingy that you have in this in these boats right you just, you just put them down so that like um the boat doesn't sink or whatever i don't know man like you must have watched those things in titanic or pirates of caribbean or whatever movie yeah so um and then we double lashed everything went through a life raft trail attached lifelines donned oil skins and life jackets and beat it so they were like whatever waves you, you are we are ready with all of these things come attack us they were like that and the first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 p.m with an ominous silence the ominous silence in the sense like some dead dead silence in the sea kind of thing the wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered after the ship with horror i realized that it wasn't a cloud but a wave like no other i had ever seen so just imagine the wave it was that huge that it just tricked them to be to look like clouds so just imagine how huge of waves they are and like i'm trying so badly not to imagine because i have these huge phobias of waves in like huge things i just don't know why like, yeah i'm so fucking freaked out of those things yeah um yeah so it appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightened breaking crest so that's that the roar increased with thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment i thought we might ride over it but then a tremendous explosion shook the deck a torrent of green and white water broke over the ship my head smashed into the wheel and i was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves i accepted my approaching death as i was losing consciousness i felt quite peaceful so a lot of things happened so this huge roar of uh, waves came up and then with a tremendous explosion the the water like got into the ship and then they were kind of sinking and then uh, the um, the author he hit his head on the wheel that steering wheel kind of thing and then like he was floating and he almost got out of the ship and he was like kind of drowning and he was like okay my time has come he accepted that his death was approaching and slowly started losing his conscious and like he was at that stage where like you're not alive or dead like like you get to choose it like if you open your eyes and like uh do whatever and like try to live then you're alive but if you just sh- shut down your eyes and just accept it it's the end so he was in that type of situation where he's not dead or alive he's like approaching death yeah unexpectedly my head popped out of the water and a few meters away we woke up was near capsizing capsizing in the sense like turning almost upside down yeah and her mass almost horizontal then a wave hurled her upright 
a lifeline jerk taut i grabbed the guard rails and sailed through the air into the wave walkers main boom subsequent waves tossed me around like uh, tossed me around the deck like a rag doll my left ribs cracked my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth somehow i found the wheel left me lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on so unexpectedly his head like popped out of the water so as i told you right he's out of the uh, ship and he's drowning so uh, his head popped out of the water he suddenly got his conscious back and then he uh, um, the wave walker it was like few meters away and this lifeline uh, jerked taut so that's uh, you have this right that jacket kind of thingy and then rope attached to it connected to the ship so that like if you get out of it like you can after the string is taut you can like climb back on it so that was the case so he was out of the ship and he uh, with that rope directed he came back to the ship and the uh, waves hurled around here and there and the mast was and the ship was like almost capsizing and then this huge wave that came up that like again made the ship back to its original position and after he got on the uh, ship it he was moving here and there and uh, the waves were like um, pushing him here and there like a rag doll and even his left ribs cracked and his mouth was filled with blood and broken teeth and like, just try to imagine all of this thing and just think how drastic things have gotten and somehow he found the wheel lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on water water everywhere i could feel that the ship had water below i dared but i dared not abandon the wheel to investigate so he was sure that even below the ship there was water and sh- shit and everything was sinking but he couldn't dare to like move out of the wheel and investigate because then like things would move so much out of control right like at least you like whatever i mean i mean your main intention would be to somehow direct out of the stormy area and like try to save yourself before you get sunken right so that's what he was trying and dared not to abandon the wheel suddenly the front hatch was thrown up and mary appeared just sinking she screamed the decks are smashed we are full of water take the wheel i shouted as i scrambled for the hatch larry and herb were pumping like madmen so they were pumping the water out of the ship broken timbers hung at crazy angles the whole starboard side bulged inwards Cl- uh, clothes clothes crockery charts tins and toys lost about in deep water i half swam half crawled into the children's cabin are you all right i asked yes they answered from the upper bunk but my head hurts a bit said sue points to a big bump above her eyes so a lot of things happen now um so from the front hatch um maybe she like threw open the door and like came out and was like we're sinking she screamed and the decks are all smashed we are full of water and stuff and then uh, um the otter was like uh, take this wheel and like handle the things i'll go and check and then larry and herb they were like pumping it mad men they, they were pumping the water out of the ship and then um he got to see that the starboard it got bulged inwards and then clothes crockery and all of this was in water and he like half swam half crawled and got into the children's cabin and was like are you all right and so she showed this huge bump on her head and was like this hurts a bit are you crazy girl if i had that huge of a bump i'd have passed out and made everyone panic but yo these kids are like wow like i don't want to spoil the story or whatever but these kids are like real good at this like real good at handling all this pressure so just read through and you'll get it so yeah i had no time to worry about bumped heads after finding a hammer screws and canvas i struggled back on the deck with the starboard side bashed open we were taking water with each wave that broke over us if i couldn't make some repairs we would surely sink somehow i managed to stretch the canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes some water continued to stream down but most of it was now being deflected over the side wall uh, over the side more problems arose when our head pumps started to block up the debris floating around the cabin and the electric pump short circuited so after this a lot of things happened so he he couldn't like worry about bumped heads and things now because things were getting out of hand and he had to do something so he started finding hammer screws and stuff to like um um make the starboard side like all right he tried to like repair it and shit and then um that was because if he couldn't make some repairs then they would surely sink and somehow he managed to like stretch the canvas and make like waterproof covers and uh, and started like covering all the holes and some water like still uh, still continued to stream below but most of it was like 
deflected over the side and more and more problems started uh, arising when the hand pump failed because a lot of debris like dirt and stuff they got into the pump and like it made it stop working and also the electric pump also like it short circuited and stuff and the water level rose threateningly back on deck i found there are two spare hand pumps had been wrenched overboard along with for stay sail the jeb the dinghies and the main anchor then i remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor i connected to an out pipe and was thankful to find that it worked so he just remembered after that that there was this another uh, electric pump that was under the chart room and he went and got that out and connected and oh sorry some technical issues so <laughs> uh, where was i where was i yeah go back so yeah all of that shit and uh, this pump this one uh, thankfully it works and the night dragged on with an endless bitterly cold routine of pumping steering and working the radio we were getting no replies for our media calls which was not surprising in this remote con- corner of the world so as this area wherever they were was so remote that even the media calls that they did media calls like some sos kind of thingy for sailors so that when they are stuck and stuff they can call for help and they'll come with helicopters and then like rescue you out of that place i guess i mean i don't even know why they did this in the first place like you already know what worse could happen and still want to do it and then now you're like panicking to that and shit i mean i would i wouldn't do all this in the first place not because i'm a coward but maybe i am yeah i can't agree yeah i mean these people are, have more guts and stuff than me so yeah Sue's head had swollen alarmingly. She had two enormous black eyes, and now she showed us a deep cut on her arm. When I asked why she hadn't made more of her injuries before this, she replied, "I didn't want to worry you when you were trying to save this one." Oh, such a cute kid. Yo, like I would have done everything that she wouldn't have done. <laughs> I would have panicked the freak out of these people. <laughs> So by morning of Jan 3rd the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for us to take 2 hours rest in rotation but we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the waterline and on checking it found that nearly all the boat's main rib frames were smashed to the knee in fact there was nothing holding up a whole section of the starboard hull except a few covered partitions so yeah there was water still like seeping in and he had to like check and stuff and then found this huge massive leak uh, down and then shit and We had survived for 50 years since the wave hit, but we woke up wouldn't hold together long enough for us to reach. I mean, Australia. So even though they were they were like 50 hours past the like wave hit and shit, uh, they knew that they couldn't make make it to Australia as the wave woke up doesn't seem like hold shit together for that long. So they had to find some way to land the ship. What do, what do they say? Like for rockets and all, you have launch the rocket. What about ships and shit? Maybe land it. I guess. Yeah. So whatever that is. So they wanted to land it somewhere closer so that they could like recover and shit. So they were like calculating and like mapping and shit, and they found this these two islands that were a few hundred kilometers to the east, and one of them, Isle Amsterdam, was a French scientific base. Our only hope was to reach these pinpricks. in the vast ocean but unless the wind and seas abated we could for sail our chances would be slim indeed the great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action so yeah so they found this island isle amsterdam that was a french scientific base and their only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean pinpricks in the vast ocean meaning like these small small portion of land in that huge ocean but unless the wind and seas abated so we could for sail a chances for these lemon deep so unless the, the wind and shit would support them their chances were very thin indeed but then the uh, great wave had like put their engine out of action so this was like their only way to survive like the only is kind of escape they see on an, and on january 4 after 36 hours of continuous pumping we reached the last few centimeters of water now we had only to keep pace with the water still coming in So now, after 36 hours of pumping, like, wow, they're doing God's work, man! Like 36 hours of pumping, wow. So after all that, they uh, they were left with just few centimeters of uh, whatever uh, water, and now they only had to worry about the water that was still coming in. And they, we couldn't set any sail on the main mast. Pressure on the rigging would simply pull 
the damaged section of the hull apart. So we hoisted the storm jib, jib and headed for where I thought two islands were. Mary found some corned beef and cracker biscuits. And we ate our first meal in almost two days. So they had their first meal after two days. Like seriously, I would have, I would have passed out like even before I, I would have got into the ship. Like they had nothing for two days and survived. That too, they were hurt and wounded, and they still survived. Like what? And another disclaimer: this is like a true story. Like it's an actual story, like an actual experience that they had when they actually went on this voyage. I still can't believe it, man. And our, but our respite was short-lived. At 4 p.m., black clouds began building up behind us again. Yo, I can't go with this again, man. Yo. Okay, so um, black clouds began building up behind us within the hour the wind was back to 40 knots and the sea seas were getting higher the weather continued to deteriorate uh, through the night and by dawn of chant 5 our situation was again disparate when i went in to conf- comfort the children john asked daddy are we gonna die i tried to assure him that we could make it and then he said but daddy he went on we aren't afraid of dying if we all can be together you and mommy sue and i I could find no words for which I could respond, but I still left the child's children's cabin determined to fight the sea with everything I had. To protect the weakened stub outside, it deta- de- I decided to heave to with the undamaged spot hull facing the oncoming waves using an improvised sea anchor of heavy nylon rope and two 22 liter plastic barrels of paraffin. That evening, Mary and I sat together holding hands as the motion of the ship brought more and more water in through the broken planks. We both felt the end was very near, but the wave walker rode out of the storm by the morning of Jan 6. With the wind easing, I tried to get a reading on the sextant. But back in the chat room, I worked on wind speeds changing, of course, the drift in current in an effort to calculate our position. The best I could determine was that we were somewhere 150 kilometers, 50,000 kilometers of ocean looking for a 65 kilometer wide island. So, yeah, there's that. So. Mm, where were we? Yeah. So the kid like gave him some good life advice that we aren't gonna die if we all can be together, you and mommy, so and I. So like that, gave him some wise advice and shit and uh, tried to like calm him down. And then the father, like just imagine yourself to be like a father and you're responsible to like protect your family and all right. So he had that much pressure on him and he was like, no matter what happens, even if I die or whatever, I'm gonna protect this family and save them from this, no matter what. And he was that determined and tried everything. And that evening, Mary and him, they were holding their hands together and uh, telling themselves that this is the end. And, oh, like this was very near to the end and we were like almost losing hope and by then we walk up the ship it rode out of the storm and by jan 6 with the end easing he tried to get the reading on the sext- um you know the mind sextant is a device to read whatever calculations so don't ever <laughs> i just caught you there <laughs> So back in the chat room, I worked on my wind speeds, changes, of course, drift and current. So he did all these calculations and shit, and he like came out uh, came out with this that on this the hundred and five, it's a, yeah, <laughs> it's always that you're trying to give this mass dialogue, and just then all your brain cells stop working. Like, oh, uh, so on this hundred and fifty thousand kilometers of huge ocean. There you are trying to find for a 65 kilometer wide island. Like, just wow. While I was thinking, Sue moved, moving painfully, joined me. The left side of her head was now very swollen and her blackened eyes narrowed to slits. She gave me a card she had made. On the front side, she had drawn caricatures of me and me with the words Here are some funny people. Did they make you laugh? I laughed a lot as well. Inside was a message Oh, how I love you both. So this card is to say thank you and let's hope for the best. Somehow we had to make it. You, these kids are angels, man. They're so affirmative on this whole wreck. Like, wow. I could never, literally, I could never 
I checked and rechecked my calculations. We had lost our main mass, I mean, lost our main compass, and I was using a spare which had not been corrected for magnetic variation. I made an allowance for this in another estimation of uh, of the influence of the westerly currents which flew through this part of the Indian Ocean. About 2 p.m. I went on the deck and asked Larry to steer a course of 185 degrees. If we were lucky, I told him with a conviction I didn't feel he could expect to see the island at about 5 p.m. Then with a heavy heart I went below, climbed down my bunk and amazingly dozed off. When I woke it was 6 p.m. and growing dark. I knew we must have missed the island and with the sail we had left. We couldn't hope to be back into the westerly winds. At that moment, a tousled head appeared by my bunk. Can I have a hug? Jonathan asked. Sue was right behind him. Why am I getting a hug now? I asked. Because you're the best daddy in the whole world. And the best captain, my son replied. Not today, John. I'm afraid. Why? You must be, said Sue in a matter-of-fact voice. We found the island. What? I shouted. It's out there in front of us, they called us, as, a, as big as a battleship. I rushed on deck and gazed with relief at the stark outline of Isle Amsterdam. It was only a bleak piece of volcanic rock and little vegetation, the most beautiful island in the world. So they've finally reached the island. They've, they are saved. Oh my god. We anchored offshore for the night, and then the next morning, all 28 inhabitants of the island cheered as they helped us ashore. ashore. With land under my feet again, my thoughts were full of Larry and Herbie, cheerful and optimistic under Derek's direst stress, and of Miri, who stayed on the wheel for all those crucial hours. Most of all, I thought of a seven-year-old seven girl who didn't want us to worry about a head injury, which subsequently took six minor operations to remove a recurring blood clot between skin and skull, and of a six-year-old boy who is not afraid to die. So that is it, my legends. So that was the story. Hope you all enjoyed it. And yeah, get better marks this time. And I better too because I have a freaking annual exam tomorrow and I'm doing shit here. So yeah, bye bye.